So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, there was an ad campaign, I think one year ago, where it said, the best run businesses run SAP. And uh, Herr Tunga Asal will now explain to us how uh, to use rootkits and trojans in your SAP landscape. Herr Tunga asks you to save the questions for after his talk, and we'll have a question round after he has finished talking. So please welcome Ertunga Asal. I'll be here. Thank you. We have some feedback, I think. Okay, some Jimi Hendrix experience. Fixed? Perfect. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Today we'll be talking about SAP systems and of course how some people can rootkit and infect those systems. Um, the main agenda is I'll give you a brief introduction about the enterprise security. I know most of you work in uh, medium to large companies. For some it's nothing new but it, may, it might be also entertaining and it will also explain why we have some problems in this area. So when I call SAP, it is just these R3 and NetWeaver applications of SAP and not the company itself. And we'll be of course talking about the SAP infrastructure security, which is also called basis security. And then we'll come to the ABAP language and I'll introduce you some examples how to attack um, ABAP codes and the ABAP rootkits and yeah, owning the most of the businesses, so to say. Of course, we'll be talking about the threat agents and how to stay secure. Uh, so, uh, let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ayrton Garsal. I'm a security researcher. Uh, okay. One question, are you able to hear me well? <laughs> Always some manipulation in the inputs. Uh, let's try this microphone for a change. Okay. Do I get a face shift or something? Works? Yeah. Hilarious. Okay. okay. So, um, now that you can hear me, I am a security researcher who is focused on enterprise systems. And I'm the founder of the ESNC GmbH. Uh, it's a company specialized in SAP security. So I can say I'm 24 seven engaged to SAP systems. And SAP has recently uh, patched some of the vulnerabilities uh, I have reported. And I'm, I just put them to see the variety of them. It is from protecting the password hashes to the certificate attacks or uh, configuration of subqui, message server, and this kind of components. We'll come to them. Uh, but first, let's talk about the typical enterprise. I mean, I come from the enterprise environment, so uh, like you see here, typical enterprise has more than a thousand of employees. And it's a circus of IT systems, so everything that you can imagine of all kinds of systems, Oracle, SQL, whatever databases, you'll find in a typical enterprise. And of course there are different versions which are usually implemented by different teams and sometimes even trainees. So also spanning to a lot of years where some departments even extinct and they don't exist anymore. In the typical enterprise the decision makers care about their bonuses than the interest of the company. This is, I, I think, very human. And it's a political battlefield about who has the bigger, bigger balls, so to say. Sorry, I'm not being sexist here, but it is, yeah, typical enterprise decision making. When we talk about the enterprise security, I mean, the truth is even achieving what we call the medium level of security is almost impossible in a big company. First, the asset management is the problem. So people 
security teams don't know what systems they have in general. So how many, even the answer of how many Oracle databases we have in our enterprise is very tough for many of them. And of course, tons of security vulnerability scanners are purchased and nobody looks at the results of these kind of scans. And the funny thing is, many of these vulnerabilities that are discovered cannot be fixed. So you suddenly notice that there's a PBX system running on a very ancient version of Solaris, and it is not supported if you patch it. So it stays there, it needs to be accessible, also by hackers, of course. You cannot fix it. And somehow, I don't know the reason why, but the typical enterprise security teams are obsessed with cross-site scripting. I don't know. Probably it took some years for people to understand how it works, so everybody is so excited to talk about it. <laughs> Don't ask me. But also my colleagues and friends from other companies, they also share the same experience. The thing with the IT security departments is, it cannot influence security decision of business applications. Because of political reasons, nobody tries to argue with the business owners, they can't. It doesn't work. So what people do, okay, we get the salaries, everything's fine, let's, we got the approval for whatever project we have, we will dedicate the resources onto that project. Is it relevant to the security of company or not? I don't care. This is generally the approach. And the hacked machines in an enterprise, basically nobody cares about them. If somehow one of those guys will be held responsible, of course, it suddenly becomes an important issue. Uh, and of course, there are some legal implications. So if some managers will be going to prison because of whatever compliance legal requirements, then it suddenly becomes important. But generally, uh, it is the area where you can find the most cover your ass kind of security in action. The defacements are interesting. Actually, what I noticed that the companies, big companies love defacements. So I cannot recommend you to do more, of course. Um, it is great because they can say, hey, our front page is hacked. Let's get the approval for the next security budget. And suddenly, 250K is approved because the managers got so scared of the skull logo and, I don't know, some kind of weird, whatever, Republican uh, country's logo. So it is excellent budget approval. So now coming to the SAP systems. These systems are business specific. So when we're talking about big logistics systems, HR finance systems, accounting, this is where the SAP systems are usually located. And SAP is industrial solutions, which means defense, aerospace, oil, gas, banking, even chemicals and other industries, there are specific SAP solutions for it. So the target area is pretty interesting for many people, in my opinion. And these systems hold the crown jewels. Uh, that's why they are called the business systems. Honestly speaking, if, from my experience, if uh, there's an SAP system in the company, it's usually the most important system and no nothing else matters that much. So it is something like the business people focus on that and they take the IT and security guys uh, they make them focus to other systems so they don't interfere with each other and there aren't very hard discussions and arguments between them. So these SAP systems are usually extensively customized. What do we mean with customizing? I mean, SAP isn't something like MS Office or something where you just like install it and expect it to run. You install SAP systems, you then hire or employ SAP consultants, they work for some hundreds of mandates, and they make, and there's like a go live, and it's in, installed, implemented, running, and of course then the migration story starts. Usually these people need to find new jobs. I don't know, maybe that's why they get some projects approved. But this is like an ongoing effort for businesses to stay up to date, and these projects are really long running. They span to a few years. But when we look at the exposure to typical hackers, I mean, who would learn about for hacking? Hacking, that's the first question. Second, how would you try it at home? I mean, we don't have mainframes at home, right? Because usually what you, some of us do, I believe. Uh, 
but usually the systems that you use for testing at home, they don't have these uh, additional components that are found in the business systems. Okay, the Sutton's law says when diagnosing, one should first consider the obvious. And this came from a bank robber, Willie Sutton, because somebody was interestingly uh, interested in asking him why he robbed the banks. And his answer was, because that's where the money is. <laughs> well, we don't know whether he actually said that, okay? Probably he didn't. Anyways, coming to the SAP security, the security in this business level focuses mostly on authorizations and segregation of duties. Segregation of duties is like if you are able to create a purchase order on behalf of a customer, of course you shouldn't be able to change its pricing, right? Then you can make it like one euro, sell it, get some commission from the customer, change it back. And the whole story usually focuses on the segregation of duties. And the segregation of duties concept, which is very, very ex expensive to implement, of course, because it's the business processes, you really need to change the way the company works. It, f it focuses the actions of a single person. So when we look at the fraud cases, what do we see? Multiple persons, two or more. Then, of course, you throw away some of your S SOD investments. And an interesting thing is, in these systems, the password security sucks. And with sucks, I mean really sucks. So 99% of the case, you don't need the segregation of duties because you need a manager approval for changing the price, right? Log on to the system, create the purchase orders, create the passwords, use the manager's account, approve the order, etc. It is actually that simple. And it costs. When we look at the IDP systems from IBM, Cisco, whatever uh, you name, I can see that they're still a baby when we're talking now about, about the enterprise systems. So just a question, look at your IDP systems, so ask your vendor how many signatures do they have for the uh, business applications. I mean, I'm sure they have great uh, malformed PDF detection kind of signatures, but this is a different story. In this area, in the business applications area, the risks are very underestimated, uh, simply because the security departments don't understand the context of business. And when we look from the SAP's numbers, uh, we are at the end of 2010, almost 400 out of 500 companies um, use SAP in the core business, roughly 80%. And let's look at the security teams of those companies. How many of them actually have some people who understand what SAP is? Then they understand what the security of SAP systems are. It's very rare. And something very, very important in my opinion, when you look at a business system, a company, sorry, an IT system, if it's something like Active Directory, Active Directory it usually belongs to the IT but the SAP systems belong to the business. So if there needs to be some decisions about the security of those systems, it needs to be uh, approved by the business, which means IT or directors, managers of IT need to fight with the business people and they don't do it. So another interesting thing is in security field, we are of course used to hearing a lot of PS, right? All the companies say, hey, whatever hell will break loose if this gets exploited and similar stuff. And the people are used to it. And the security departments usually get challenged. They say, okay, something's wrong with SAP system. You mentioned, I say, okay, what is actually wrong? Usually people cannot explain what's actually wrong because they don't know it by themselves. Or what we tried to do, I mean, when they dumped me some SAP systems almost five, six years ago, I tried to find out actually what the problems are. And then you show some command line, uh, I don't know, like breaking the hashes or something else, then people say, yeah, but this is too sophisticated. I mean, we're talking about SAP, nobody has these high uh, 
<coughs> intelligence and skill set, uh, whatever. And this is very common. And the moment you get such a response, you know that that project that you are after will never be approved. So, I assume that we all don't know the SAP systems very much. Okay, for me it was a very, very unique experience in the beginning. I'll try to make it extremely simple for you. So, we have the users that are using the sub GUI, the front-end application. And we have service users, so to say, that are using the RFC protocol. RFC, I thought, is something like RPC. Actually, similar. It, say, it means a remote function call. Basically, you ask application server to execute something for you. And these are usually business functions. So, these services and these users usually connect to the load balancer, which is called the message server. I don't know what's the reason for it. And I mean, this is a typical three-tier ar architecture. We have the presentation layer, application servers, uh, which process the requests, and then the database, the central database. Um, when we showed the issues to the people, as I said, the first approach with the command lines, et cetera, didn't work. So we tried to make them, make the exploits, exploitation, sorry, a little bit more user friendly. So we started with the load balancer. Okay, I mean, there isn't anything called SAP load balancer. This is just the terms I'm using for explaining to yourself. So such product doesn't exist. So this is called the message server. And if this is not properly configured, and if you, of course, understand that this should be properly configured from reading between the lines of some hundred thousands of lines of manuals, an attacker can register its own servers. So this is something I coded a while ago. It basically imitates an application server and it registers itself on the load balancer. And when we look at the SAP system, it's the screen below, I think it's not very visible to you, but we have the CCC 666 application servers registered there. So suddenly you have five servers where the load balancer is dispatching requests and it becomes 200. And imagine the round robin and similar kind of approaches. Um, you can do man in the middle and a lot of other ugly stuff, which can be prevented if you separate the internal and external communications of the message server. This is possible. So this is actually fixable, which is good. So basically you need to fix and configure an access control list. But you see this is technical. It's difficult for people to grasp. Then focusing on the application server, which is called the gateway in the SAP terminology, there is a built-in remote shell functionality in the RFC. It's a special type of RFC uh, communication. And this is excellent for remote administration without authentication because it doesn't have any kind of authentication. Good thing, the SAP is extremely well built in terms of scaling to different operating systems and different databases. So, the remote shell works on all sorts of AX, HP, Unix, ZOS, Windows, Linux, whatever you can think of, and many operating systems I never heard in my life. Good thing, this can be restricted by SecInfo access control list configuration. The bad thing, this access list can be bypassed. The good thing, again, this is fixed. So, um, Mariana mentioned not about the bypass, uh, exploit, uh, but this functionality, so to say, in 2007 in Black Hat. And three years later, we are doing lots of SAP assessments. What is the percent? I, I really don't want to say. <laughs> so basically, people need to apply the latest patches and the configuration, which is uh, fine. But usually, people are not used to doing that in the SAP area. Because somehow uh, these systems stay there forever, for tens of years, and people are used to not touching them when they are running because there's a business impact, of course. So I'll do, I'll do a demo right now. Uh, what will we do? We have an application server. This is a basic GUI application that talks RFC protocol. 
and it connects to the application server 557 and we basically attack to this system. And as I said, we try to make it as simple as possible so that some business people can understand what's going on. Um, I hope we succeeded in that one. So if my machine hasn't crashed, no, not this one. Yeah, oops, also not this one. Sorry, too many windows. OK, so this is visible, right? You can see the phones and everything. OK, good. So what do we have? I mean, this, there is an application like this. Forget about the application. But basically, we are trying to connect to the application server. Of course, first, we are scanning this uh, application server, which is running on another VMware. I know it's very lame to have Windows virtual machines, but guys, sorry. So this is the VMware where the SAP system is running. So we basically see that this, everything that you see here is anonymously obtained. So we're not using any kind of user authentication or anything. So we click and if we can, if my keyboard lets me, I will type a command. I mean, I really don't know what to type, so CMDC this. And yes, we have this red button, which the managers really wanted to see. OK, they want to see a red button. So guys, if you are coding some exploits, put somewhere a red GIF or something. You can get it in Google Images and put this button. So this works in all Unix and all kind of systems, basically. This is the exploit. As you see, there is nothing that like interesting there. So no weird Python calls that are using some weird techniques. When we showed this, the response we got is, yes, but you need two high skills for it, because it is like command line. Then what did we do? We implemented a file manager running on RFC protocol. <laughs> so when you click this, you can actually get to it. And if you have like a secret TXT there, and if you just click to it, <laughs> well, we have a system which is protected by Sekimfo configuration here. So actually, if you try to execute this one, uh, let's take another command here, for example. Who am I? We are now executing it on the vulnerable one, OK? So and to authorities, are you able to see it? Do I need to like zoom? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so if. This is protected by a scheme for configuration. We are trying to execute it. Well, scheme for configuration doesn't allow executing command, which is good. But as I said, this can be bypassed, and we implemented it with this button here. <laughs> and you can again press this red button. So, yeah. So, let's continue with our slides. Okay, this we have done so far. I mean, this I put there so that if you look at the slides later, you have some sort of a reference. I know it's like too much text in one slide, but the thing is, there is this myth about the RFC protocol that is so impossible and so only like very few people in the world can execute something with it. And if you have GUI users, they are critical, okay? They need to have very proper permissions. But the RFC users, since nobody can execute anything with them, they can get the root rights, which is called sub all in SAP systems. But, I mean, these systems are business systems. They are made to be 
friendly and compatible, okay? So there's an RFC SDK, of course, which supports Java, C, Perl, whatever you can think of. But you don't need them because when you install the subquery, there's an application called start RFC, which lets you execute application servers. So if you run this command, uh, you can actually create a new user called Satriani and you can make that a GUI user and you can actually give support rights to this user. And this is built in functional, so I mean, there's no exploit here. It is just the, so from the SAP company side, the vendor side, this is intended functionality, nothing wrong. Put proper permissions to your users. But the people somehow don't get it. They somehow think that the service users where the password change of the 60 days never applies to, so they have the same password for years, can do anything on the system. And of course, if you look at the file shares and just browse for start RFC or similar commands in the Windows search uh, in the company, you find a lot of scripts which are, which are using these kind of uh, remote calls. And if you are at such a company, you really need to tighten and eliminate these kind of scripts. Another good thing with this new improvements in technologies, now the RFC protocol also runs over HTTP and swap, which means even if you put some nice firewall protection, usually in the companies there is a proxy server, which of course restricts to porn and this kind of stuff, but doesn't restrict to its own SAP systems. So, I mean, this is again not a problem of the vendor, but this is the problem of the implementation in the customers that the internal proxies of the companies usually let you connect to the swap RFC ports where you can again execute these kind of calls. So basically support root rights for communication service users should never happen. And again, I just put these ones, these, I mean, many of the stuff I show here right now are known by the SAP guys. Either they don't care, it is some sort of learned helplessness, uh, and the security guys don't know what these are or even uh, that these things exist. So SAP systems don't let you normally read data from the database directly. But there is an RFC called RFC read table which does it. Well, of course, the users are and the hashes are stored in a table, right? So it is possible to use RFC read table for obtaining the users and their hashes. But there's a bug in the RFC read table. So somehow, initially, this uh, experimental thing, if the fields are binary fields, you know, for one byte you have two hex characters, right? It doesn't calculate it properly. So if you have 20 bytes, it is saying 20 hex characters. So you only get half of the hash. So of course the question is to you, can you break the passwords uh, just by having only one, the first half of the hash? So you probably know much better. And RFC user interface I just shown, the RFC ABAP install and run is also an interesting one. We'll come to that one or similar functionality. Basically, it takes ABAP and executes it. So, jumping to another topic, I mean, I wanted to also show stuff about password security and newer algorithms, but we won't have much time for it. Um, SAP systems need to be, of course, interconnected, and you have many SAP systems in a company. So many people, many companies use the single sign-on. And somehow this is marketed inside these companies uh, as if this is sort of a security feature. I mean, single sign-on is not a security feature, it's a convenience feature. So if you just read the secure store and forward documentation from SAP, you get more information about this mechanism. And there is a file actually, which is part of the personal security environments. It holds a private key data for generating the certificates for the SAP systems. So this is usually the sub PC file, or in the database this is called SSFPCD for data. The problem here is if an attacker obtains it, the attacker can also create security certificates for the users. And this is accepted per default, and the attacker can create certificates for any user. 
And this idea actually didn't come from me. It came uh, from a good friend of mine, Ralph Nelson, a few years ago. Uh, he's an SAP guru, and I'm very happy that he's with us today. But it was very good for me to understand the mechanisms behind it. First, I'll do the demo, what this actually means for us. Again, we will use the business uh, manager approach. So we have, I mean, you under, again, another red button, of course, but you understand that with this file manager, we can like get download TFTP, FTP, OD, whatever commands, and get this PC file, right? Or we can get it from the database. This, this part of the attack is clear. The next part is generating those certificates and we can actually, if you're lucky, I might have the demo effect and it can crash, let's see. Yeah, okay, it crashed. Oh, okay. What did we do? We generate a certificate for a user. What will we do, of course, think that you are a business. As a business person, you need to go and press the red button, right? And we press the red button. And if this works, we will log on to the SAP system. And we did. I know you didn't understand what's going on. Because, same reason, the business people also didn't understand what's going on here. I'll make it more simple for you. What is actually going on? Something is generated and a pop-up. I mean, first of all, this is the SAP GUI. So this is where you work and do everything in the SAP system. So you have your office components, logistics, everything's done through this GUI. Of course, this is complicated. So I'll make it easier for you to understand. We can say enumerate clients, and clients doesn't mean the clients. It means organizational unit in an SAP system. So we are connecting to the SAP system and getting what are the organizational units there. And we will just say, let me see all the users in the client 000. And again, if this doesn't crash, we will be able to see the users of that system. And since I'm a very, very lazy person, I, of course, get also the permissions and see which users have support, and you have some sort of highlighting so that you don't waste a few seconds more. But what this means is now we can click to any user, okay, and wait a few seconds. So we have the Mike G now, and we became Mike G. So, okay, I show with another user. I'm clicking to Mary B, which is another user, guys. I, it's very hard to impress some people, I know. <laughs> but, thank you. <laughs> oh, this became, this is the bug, sorry. This is the bug. We became Stefan accidentally instead of Mary. Sorry. We need to improve this one. I showed this at a company uh, where the SAP guys were there also who were responsible. And there was also a person from the service organization. And the person asked me whether they could use this tool internally because they need to support the clients. And <laughs> <laughs> it can surely have some use. But what you see right now, is like the end of segregation of duties concept. So people really need to secure these systems um, properly. So we go back to our slides. I mean, there is actually a pin protection for this PC file. So when you just dump the file from the file system, you cannot use it. And The previous part was also, I mean, also done by Ralph. But this part, I said, OK, there's a pin protection. Would it be possible to bypass this pin protection? And I was trying to see whether I can do it. And I thought I found a way. But it, it was a weird feeling. 
So I googled whether there's some more documentation about this mechanism. There wasn't much, but I found a document by Sun. There is a file called create v2 file. Okay, this is for creating like a sort of another certificate for the certificate, which uh, can be securely used. But in the documentation about how to create the certificate, it says this create v2 file is used to securely access to the PSC file without providing the password. I really would love to know that mechanism because that's like solution to the complete security problematic in the companies. And just below it, it says, the sec login must be carried out under the account of the seed ADM. So if it's done with another user, it doesn't work. But if you use this user, it has to work. So, I mean, so somebody was actually much uh, faster than me and already did some documentation on the subject and actually published it and this came from Sun Microsystems. My recommendation is disable this mechanism and if some people come up with ideas of using it then tell them not to use it because uh, of course you can secure it with like a security token like an external token device etc. But I mean it is a very tough challenge and you really need to know the implications before moving forward. Okay, now another topic. That's the canon India or something. He's my boss. Okay, so the ABAP applications. ABAP is the language used by SAPs. You might have heard about it or, or have already done something with it. In an SAP system, the business executables, so to say, they're not binaries like we know, but executables are coded with the ABAP language. This is a 4GL language. And in an NSP test system, there are roughly 700,000 executables and in a business system in an ECC 60 system this is more than 2 million so and some of these programs have more than 50,000 lines of code this is a very very powerful language and very easy to learn language that's why it's a 4GL and actually the low level functionality like encryption etc is proxy to the uh, kernel so that part we won't be handling today We'll just focus on the ABAP applications. And mainly we will see what ABAP injection means, what it can achieve, uh, etc. It is actually possible to execute dynamic ABAP in an SAP system. This, is, this was something I really searched for a long time. And the first time I learned something about ABAP a few years ago, I said, hey, can I do like dynamic ABAP, like dynamic SQL? And I couldn't find it. But some of the developers know it. And these guys really have these challenges every day and they find workarounds for it. So they're hacking the SAP systems almost every day in a good, good way, of course. What this generates a routine pool does is this statement takes import source code lines, compiles them and executes them. This is what it does. And there are some other programs, of course, which was doing it intentionally for functionality or unintentionally. So this is a very good feature, lifesaver, uh, but it can also be a security disaster because the thing is if you have very old SAP systems, 10 years old, etc., there are some or different SAP systems, you don't have the same tables. So if you need to access them or generate variables from those tables, then you get a syntax error or like a dump, so to say. So if you use these kind of workarounds for locating, creating, doing the similar stuff, it is, your code is actually more usable. But it is of course problematic. One problem uh, was found in the TMSCI start service RFC function. So this was used by the transport system. In SAP transport means generally software installation. So you transport files to the SAP system, new functionality, new ABAP executables reports, and they get installed by the admin to the production system, for example. And this is a remotely, ex uh, remotely executable function. 
And what it does is it takes an input table as the source code and then executes it, which is excellent. So this is the representation of the vulnerable part. So generate subroutine pool, PP table, name, X context. So, and there's a perform here, which lets uh, those source code lines and the form inside it execute it. SAP patched it with uh, a patch uh, more than a year ago. But the interesting thing is the TMS ADM password for many, many years is a default password, and that password is password. And you can't change it. You, you, I mean, yes, you couldn't change it before because everything broke, but now uh, this is fixed. And you can actually change this password, which is a great feature, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, guys, I mean, I'll be honest. This is, this is, we're talking about a giant ship. And I see systems, okay, I'll, I, I won't be talking much about the password hashes, whatever, but there are like different password hash code versions. And the current version right now is like HI in this kind of passwords. And B was introduced in 1992. So, I see systems with users which have password hash A. So imagine these users are probably older than me or I don't know. Uh, so the security attacks didn't exist at those times and because of the backwards compatibility, many things were problematic. So uh, let, let's, let me show you some stuff about, uh, do we have a demo for it? Uh, let me see because too many demos, oh, okay, we have a demo. Of course, when we explained about the ABAP injection, this was also very complicated for the business people. So we made another red button. So what are we doing now? We are using RFC, using this vulnerable function, connecting to the remote application server, and executing this code. So here I have the output. This is my output variable. Let's say hello world, so we have the hello world in, if it works, in ABAP injection. It does. So uh, we have an ABAP injection right now on the remote system. Just to show, I, for example, see Sci datum, and it gives us the date of the remote application server. It is this system, okay, this remote system. It's sometimes confusing with the VMware. So we are at the remote system, what we can do? Of course, we can like list all users. I mean, we are lazy, <laughs> right? So doing the same things again and again, best to have the shell codes easily accessible. So we can <laughs> list all users. We can actually execute operating system commands. So, if, again, my keyboards. Hmm. I mean, this is for security guys, of course, very cool, but actually, um, if you hack an SAP system, what do you do with the operating system? Uh, and usually people will say, yeah, but are you the system user or are you a regular user? I mean, I don't care. I am a user that can access to the database. So I won't be formatting the hard drive, so I'll just access the data. This is the point. Um, of course, you can do many, many things, but uh, we can, for example, retrieve the user hashes, just to show you. And if we retrieve them, we should find a way to break them. I mean, I don't find any uh, nice uh, SAP password uh, cracker. John the Ripper is excellent, of course, but it's not very business-oriented, as you know. <laughs> so we have another one. And we have import from clipboard button. This is similar to the red button, but in a different way. It imports from the, yeah, this should be a red button, actually. <laughs> Short, okay. I'll Press anyways. 
Well, there's a lot of welcomes, right? I mean, this is, of course, a test system, but in the real systems, this is also very similar. Since because of the business culture, when a new employee arrives, you welcome the employee, okay? So it's this American way of, like, everybody's happy in the company. Uh, so the pastors are usually welcome in the enterprises. And when we showed this thing uh, at a company on, on a test system which is with th some thousands of users, do you know what the, the people, the owners of the system said? They looked, they said, oh shit. If Betripsrat sees this, they can kill us. <laughs> because we shouldn't, I mean, these were test users, these weren't the users, but we shouldn't ever see the user's password. So what can we do about it? We have now, of course, the Betripsrat button, which actually <laughs> messed the password. Guys, don't, understand, don't underestimate the Betripsrat's power. It is another power game. <laughs> I mean, I'm not against it. I think it is one of the good sides of Germany, although some people hate it. But it might be challenging. Because then they said, hey, but you can see the last logon dates of those users. So we had to put another button there for disabling the last logon dates of the Wii users. So, yeah. Okay. Um, we have the passwords, I mean, do we need to do anything more with the, let me see the time. Oh, okay, we don't have much time, yeah, sorry. Okay, the SQL injection doesn't exist in the or one equals one uh, kind in the ABAP because it's prepared statements. But there's of course a feature which lets developers do dynamic not dynamic, but uh, they can use variables in the table names. It is not something you can very easily do with a lot of SQL engines. You can give the column names or table names or the workflows dynamically. And some developers use it for convenience. This is problematic, of course. And this is actually a concept I found uh, at, at a documentation, at a blog. It is called runtime type creation. But if this is not used properly, this is basically accessing the system and retrieving almost everything. Um, I won't be able to show the demo as we, we are running out of time, but there's also another statement called exec SQL. As I said, the SAP is database independent. So when you write the code, it works with Oracle uh, DB2 and everything. If you say exec SQL, it is sent directly to the SQL engine. So if you are doing something specific to Oracle, you can actually do it. And of course, if people use these kind of statements in the business applications, uh, then they are vulnerable to SQL injection. So this is something that people need to be aware of. And of course, the very important cross-site scripting topic. <laughs> it is really lame to talk about it. I'll just, I mean, everything you know of cross-site scripting, you know it already. There's one catch. These uh, private, certificates, the keys that we've generated, they are also used as authentication token in uh, portal applications. Which means if you don't protect them properly, some people can just get that cookie and this my sub SSO2 field uh, is the authentication field. So you need to do something for hiding it. I mean, we, at uh, the previous company, we couldn't find any very feasible solution. So we put like an F5 and then just encrypted the cookie completely based on IP address and some magic. Uh, but of course, we have the fire ships and what happens like in France, people come from the nut. So you have some thousands of users coming from the same IP. So that's, that's a tough uh, challenge in that case. And when we talk about ABAP executable manipulation, there is a statement called the insert report. This actually inserts ABAP code into any executable. And actually, you can even call an editor to make it more user friendly, because this is for GIAD. If you ever find it on custom develop code in the company, then something fishy is there. So you really need to have a look at this one. So if you see insert report and editor call there in the same report, uh, 
something fishy is going on. I mean, this was sort of a feature in SAP system sometime, and there was a programming mistake, Matt, there was an authorization check, but it wasn't done properly, uh, which let people actually execute and install any ABAP. And I mean, if you want to understand what it looks like, again, very fast because we are running out of time. So, so it asks you for a report name, and if I say ZCCC, it will create an executable uh, in the SAP system. And this is basically it. So. And this is the complete exploit. So you can actually say report CCC and I don't know, write hello world. Something like that. Okay? And you can say save and it will just save it. I mean, with my machine, the debugger crashes. So Let's see. Anyway, I can skip it. We can look at that one later. It's not that important. Well, we come to the main topic. Um, now we're talking about the ABAP rootkits. Okay? We are able to manipulate critical system functionality. And when I started with the university research about this topic, I first wanted to see the rootkits. And until I got to that, I learned a lot of other stuff, which I explained to you about the gateway, about the load balancer, Mensis server. The thing is, ABAP rootkits are feasible. It is for GL, it is easy to implement, and you can modify the system executables. And in SAP, there is a special function group called SRFC. It doesn't require authentication. The reason is, for example, the system information, system name. Uh, that is very uncritical information, so probably it was decided to make that anonymous so people can understand names of each other and similar. But these functions can be tampered as well. And you, the attacker can install the manipulated code which accepts a parameter like one character, and which adds like a sub all users, manipulates ABAP reports, runs operating system commands, etc., and of course, which deletes the logs. So first of all, the rule never logged to the same system because the attacker will simply delete it. And uh, this, this should be also known. I mean, I have the proof of concept here, but yeah, the time is very short. I'll talk about another phase of this, uh, uh, this attack. First, the sub-GUI is this application, the front end you just saw, okay? It's a very, very powerful front end. Runs also with Java, also with web. And it actually has an API so that people can download Excel reports or export the Excel, etc. Well, the thing is this uh, previously came without any kind of filtering. So if somebody manipulates the system, it would be possible to execute anything on the client code. So here with client, I mean the client, the business manager, or whoever you want to talk about. And SAP fixed this with 720 this year. Um, and I can see that this, this is a very, very good improvement in this area, because what happens is we have our application, which talks RFC, and this a text application server, which manipulates the logon code in the database. And then, if any client connects to the system, basically, code is executed on this client. So, so the demo of this one would be, okay, this is still, that <coughs> SAP systems are very robust. This is just my VMware and weird configuration and testing, of course. I mean, usually when you talk with SAP guys, they always say, hey, you can break SAP systems. I can honestly say that these are systems are like business systems there. I mean, they don't, the business systems 
don't care about confidentiality that much. It's the availability always. Of course, confidentiality is important, but always availability because five minutes, five, 50 minutes, one hour costs a lot of money to companies. So let's say this is uh, the system of our victim and our system just like connects to and and accesses the application, okay? So our attacker just manipulates, yeah, this requires advanced copy and paste skills, I'm sorry about it. <laughs> you see that I'm not very, very good at, I will shift. Okay. So, we now manipulated the system, and if our admin logs onto the system, what was it, manager, right? I hope I did it fine, yeah. And he logged onto the system, right? Okay, everything's same. Well, if you look at here, and if I press Control F5, we have a new user called Pamela here. So, <laughs> okay, they are coming. So I have very little time. I have to rush. They're coming after me. Um, I mean, of course, people say, yeah, but this is, you need to be administrator to the user. I mean, it doesn't matter. User space in a business environment is more important than the administrator rights. So you really need to go to security center, configure it, disable this kind of stuff, and uh, update to the latest sub -QA in order to protect against this, which comes to the main part of the presentation. So everything I presented here was the introduction, okay? Uh, this is done, okay, learned, everybody knows. Um, this is a new concept, uh, the triple penetration attacks. Part of my scientific research, I mean it. So the first penetration, the attacker exploits the weaker system. I mean, I just write this here because when you ask the business guys, the important system is the production system, right? It's very important. But the truth is, if you look at the test or development systems, who connects to the test systems or development systems? Developers, admins. So the most important guys are actually the users of those systems with weakest security settings. So in SAP, it's usually testing, development, quality assurance, and production. And if, with using the attack vectors I showed, somebody hacks those weak systems, they can also infect the users of those systems. So this is the first penetration. The users, uh, the system is penetrated and critical code is manipulated. The second penetration is what I've showed with the Pamela user, okay. Uh, the attackers write some code and when the clients connect to those systems, and since it's ABAP and he has the complete business logic, he can say only the managers, only the business role, only the users in uh, France, and this is possible. The users of those systems get infected. And I, you know the topic with antivirus bypass, user mode root keys and everything else. So also like sniffing the connection to other systems is possible. So at that, that, at that place, the client security, so endpoint security is very, very critical. The third penetration is actually this infected client, which is the administrator, it connects to all production systems, right? Or also connects to the systems of the partners. This is the third one. So what happens is, there are SAP hosting providers because SAP is very expensive to set up and maintain. And for small businesses, it is much easier to pay, I don't know, some thousands of euros per month and get some users on a remote system. 
if it's an SAP hosting or SAP training system, the attacker just gets an account, and in a training system, you can easily get a sub all account with root rights and manipulates the logon functions. Everybody who logs on to the system will be also infected. So the person can just wait some time, and I can tell you that this will be a, a great disaster. So people really need to take care of this, their business and protect that and stop that from happening. So first, shared hosting for SAP system, I think this is a no-go. And second, you should have very proper endpoint protection on the local laptops or desktop machines where outbound connections and like code execution is uh, strictly controlled. Uh, this brings, of course, to the concept of the Robin Hood worm. I mean, I checked in the internet, I couldn't find any, so I say it's the Robin Hood worm. Well, this worm, after infecting enough clients, this can access to the financial data of the companies. And for a worm writer, this is really like the wet dream. So what I thought about, uh, and also Alex, Alex Kornbrus also helped with the ideas, and imagine a worm at the end of the year, at the end of financial year, checks the balance of the company and looks and say, hey, we made enough profit. So this worm donates like uh, one-tenth of a percent of the uh, profit of this company to Red Cross, Red Crescent, I don't know, Save the Children or Julian and WikiLeaks so that WikiLeaks doesn't have any financial problems anymore. This is possible. And this difficult but possible. I mean, I wouldn't call it very difficult. And actually, more evil would be this worm suddenly publishes the salary information of people. I mean, can you really imagine this? The guy the, or the girl in the travel department is getting twice as money as you and just that person's booking some flights. Of course, the legal implications uh, are much worse. So I want to come to the real point of this talk. I mean, when we look at the trade agents, who, from whom we should uh, fear? First, this is the ABAP developer, because the ABAP developers are at the ring zero, ring minus one, minus ten, whatever you call it. Okay, it runs at the heart, and the user rights doesn't apply to this person, because he can just add himself authorizations uh, as he likes in the database. He has rights to do that. And since this is a development or testing system, usually people give sub all uh, rights to those developers. And audit logs are typically disabled on those systems because people say, hey, this is just a testing system. It's not important at all. So these should be also present. And a very funny thing I notice is that people tr trust the developer so much, like we go, for example, to make an assessment, and like two guys stay behind us watching the screen because it's an HR system and it's mission critical data, and then we go downstairs to the uh, canteen at lunch, and the ABAP developer guy from, uh, who is an external, just comes, runs code, does the stuff, goes, and nobody even cares what he's doing because he's doing some business reporting coding. So this is uh, typical the case, and the big companies are very, very eager to hire employees coming from the competitor, okay? So whenever we say, hey, this guy worked with your competitor for three years, they say, oh, cool, we will get this guy and we'll learn all the secrets of the competitor. <laughs> Honestly speaking, every big company which uses SAP systems will need some ABAP developer in the next one or two years. So if uh, we're talking about industrial espionage, it is very likely that uh, the competitor might have sent this guy to them. And if you say, yeah, I want to get this guy, it, you should be really, really uh, very careful. And also, another thing is think about the consultancy companies. I mean, this world works on consultancy, and these guys don't go to one enterprise, they go to tens of enterprises. So it works at the big uh, logistics company, and next day goes for consultancy to another one. And if, if you imagine somebody bribing those guys and like asking them to put a few lines more about code in the system, I mean, this is no joke. I mean, this can happen if not already happened. So, 
Of course, everybody likes this uh, concept about Stuxnet and uh, nuclear reactors and all the sci-fi things, but SAP software is also used in production of like fighter jets, power grids, and critical production systems. So, and it has 4GL, so it is much easier to code with. So, unlike the FX talk with reversing the uh, step seven, it is much, much easier to write. So, I would say, uh, from my experience, uh, it would be unreasonable to think that the similar to Stuxnet is not already done for such systems. And imagine the next Eurofighter aircraft with the CCC logo on the wing sign. <laughs> and the question is, how would you detect it? I mean, there are things, of course, May, you assume that everything is well checked, but these people trust the electronic systems. And if somebody orders the screws, which are like one millimeter bigger, it changes everything. Imagine you are ordering like for 40 uh, million of those screws or anything else. Or if people really screw up with the financials, suddenly a big company can notice that they don't have any cash because the cash flow is somehow yeah, not like they expected. And at the end of the month, the company simply cannot uh, pay anything because there isn't uh, any money to pay. And th this can happen. So I'm not talking about some weird scenarios, but this can really happen. So, so first minute, uh, first few minutes I'll uh, do the conclusion. Uh, just to repeat, how, how can we uh, secure the systems? I mean, SAP did a lot of improvements in security and one of the very good things is the documentation was always very, very big. Now there's like a 10 pages document, 14 pages, and this really explains the basic concepts about the architecture, systems architecture. I mean, you really need to read it, and if you are in the security team of a big company, and you aren't aware of this link, this is a good indication that the SAP guys don't care about you because everybody received this link, because this is sent to all customers of SAP. So either the security, uh, person in the SAP portal is not configured or the guys just don't care about you. So it's a good finding, really. And another important thing, don't implement this access control list six months after the system is online. I mean, this is fun to hear for us, but the people do it like this. They implement everything running, then they start implementing the security stuff. And of course, they get hacked until the production system is live because it takes six months to apply the stuff into the production systems with all these phasing and maintenance windows. Um, I would say analyzing the systems with an ABAP integrity checker is a very uh, good way to detect these kind of uh, manipulations, but there are many products. So the one I know is from Mariana from Onapsis, and another one is the one that we made at the company. So. Uh, not much options in that area. And the development systems should never have access to the folders uh, which production systems import these transports and install on their systems because the developers simply can manipulate them and uh, then the malicious codes jumps to your production system. So just the process related recommendations from me. If you have some developers, ABAP guys, um, you really need to think about the check-in and leavers process. So if the guy leaves, can he, I mean, if he is fired, of course, that's a risk, right? He might be very, very angry to you and he might have planted something. So this should be very well taught. And especially the external consultants, I mean, they are walking uh, landmines, I, I really mean it. <laughs> so the code security is, of course, I mean, you can also do a lot of manual things. There are tools, for, for example, from Virtual Forge and from ESNC, but you can also do manual audit of the code and at least look at the generate subroutine pool or insert report. I mean, it is not much compared to everything, but it is something. And if you find something, then it's excellent. Uh, you can escalate it. Another very funny thing is that people, because of this integration and production scenarios, they say, okay, the other systems are not very interesting to be secured, but the passwords of the productive systems are copied back 
to these uh, weak systems. They are synchronized. So if the guy just hacks the development system or the integration system and cracks the passwords, most of those, at least the system users or service users, actually work on the production system because people need to test those users and the functionality. So usually those accounts have the same password. This, of course, needs to be uh, changed. So again, get rid of insecure or default passwords. I mean, get the bloody John the Ripper and run a crack on your systems. Uh, at least do it once in a year and just eliminate those users. And SAP has improved also the sorting and hashing of the passwords. Uh, previously, the B code, it didn't uh, have any case sensitivity and it was just limited to eight characters. And when you look at the database B code and the G code, I mean, they are close to each other. So the attacker would just crack the B code. So disable the backwards compatibility and use the stronger hashes. And of course, I mean, this is something, it's very funny to recommend, but I mean, follow the vendor security notes. Nobody does in the security team. And usually the infrastructure guys just look at it, don't understand anything and just skip because it's too much effort. Well, the last thing is convincing the upper management that staying three years behind in security pages is not a good idea, okay? Especially, I mean, SAP moved to uh, regular patching like the Microsoft, so there's the patch Tuesday of, for SAP applications. So every month, people should sit down, look at the patches and just install them. And this is just there from the September, which is a giant step for an enterprise application. So. Oracle did it with the quarterly patches before, and now we have the monthly patches. And uh, I think this month's patch included more than a few hundred fixes, which is good. So um, I would like to thank, of course, Stefan Fünfrecken from uh, Eurosec, uh, and also Ralph Nelson from the next trust work. I hope I spelled this correct. Um, and Christian Wipperman from SAP and of course rest of the product security response team and all the great guys at SAP. So, any questions we have? No? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to uh, shoot me, as I said. University research is cool, and if you want to uh, join us, just let us know. Yes, I, th I think we have a little time for like five minutes question and answer session. Are there, sorry, are there questions from the end of the room? Please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to arrive. Questions from the back of the room? Anyone? I, I knew it. I mean, I will tell you something. Usually, if I, I'm so excited and I talk about lots of the stuff that I think cool, nobody understands it. Because this is something you need to be dedicated for it. I mean, this SAP security, you cannot do it part time. If you want to go for it, you need to dedicate a lot of uh, resources. That's why the security guys are very lazy. So I don't expect any questions, but still, if we have some rebels, I would love to hear them. Okay, we don't. okay. Um, then we have a question from the Mission Angel who picks the questions from the IRC and I will walk with the microphone in front of the speaker now. Okay. Okay, uh, there are actually two questions. Um, one I'm not sure you will be able to answer, but uh, how much do, does the penetration test suite cost? Uh, this is an academic uh, talk. So forget the penetration suite and the pricing of it. So, um, okay. Next question, please. <laughs> Thank you. The Fuck the commercial. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you aware of any actual attack that happened on a SAP system? Uh, regarding rootkits, yes. I, I was involved with one. Um, not <laughs> personally. <laughs> Shit. I confessed it. Uh, in that case, it was a developer, an ABAP developer, and uh, it was a very serious case, and we accidentally detected it. I mean, I didn't expect to detect it, and we did, and we saw that, and of course, I was very happy, and everybody was sad, but yes. <laughs> this is the one that I can talk about. There were also other uh, serious ones, yeah. And this is all, right? Okay, 
I thank you guys, and if you buy me a beer later on, you can. Okay, one more question, more right here. Short. Where can I download the sources? Sources of SAP in the SAP system. You oh. can just your your programs. The thing is, we are using some paid components, and the guys don't let some sort of uh, GPL uh, kind of coding because their components are commercial. So I, I mean, I would be very interested in finding ways of making things more. Uh, open source, so just drop me an email, we can find some solutions to that. Okay, yeah. But um, one more thing again, I mean, forget the ex exploits. This talk is about the awareness of this. I mean, I showed you a few, I could show you some more, much more, other people also. So there is a problem there and people should start uh, brainstorming how to fix these issues. Okay? Okay, thank you very much. I think you could stay here for like five more minutes and people can come up, ask uh, the questions to you in person. I would like to close the talk at this point, mainly because my money, uh, or my wages, my salary is paid by SAP too. And uh, I, Shocked. I hope... I, I knew why I'm... No, the, the talk is introduced so late now, I know it. No, it's, it's um, basically transferred or calculated using an SAP system, and I'm kind of worried now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So, salary rise for you for the next month. <laughs>